Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, I forgot to get his attention with the problems back there. But, um, there was one thing with uh, announcements I wanted to, to uh, point out was the apple butter boil. And we had a video prepared but uh, to, to uh, show some people what an apple butter boil is in case you, you didn't know. But um, we're still having difficulties. So, uh, But anyway, we uh, potentially want to make, try and make, uh, for uh, the fall festival, October 29th, two kettles of apple butter. And what does that mean? It means a lot. It means we would need your help. It means that we need Thursday night a group of people to peel apples and core them and to cut them into sections called snits. And then we need to uh, garner about uh, 16 at least peach baskets of, of these pieces of apple. That's Thursday night. Then Friday night into Saturday about noon, hopefully, we will be making apple butter. And that process involves cooking down uh, 35 to 40 gallons of cider, and then, am I missing anything, Steve? No. <laughs> and then adding, uh, adding apples into the cider and cooking them down until they become mush. <laughs> and then once they're mush, uh, we, uh, spices are added, and voila, it becomes apple butter. And then there's more to do. Then it has to cool somewhat, but then be jarred canned, if you will, and, uh, and then um, hopefully that all would be done by about noon on Saturday, and uh, the product then would be available for sale, and then the Fall Fest would happen right after that, where there'd be, uh, you know, games and so forth for the kids. Um, so there's a lot of things going on. We, we uh, still need um, a couple items to be able to pull this off. Um, I believe we have, we've just gotten rings for kettles. Now you need uh, obviously a, a three-legged ring to set the kettle on so you can build a fire underneath. Then we also need uh, metal shields that go around the ring to keep the fire in and the heat in, but uh, with an opening that you can also stoke the fire. Then um, some things that, uh, other things that are missing that we don't seem to be able to get a hold of that we had years ago and that is long-handled copper uh, ladles. The, the little ladle or bucket part at the end is copper uh, onto a long handle so that as you dip out the apple butter, because uh, sometimes it boils over and you have to start dipping, you know, so that the, the, the liquid goes down in your kettle. Uh, so, and we don't have those, so I don't know if anybody has any um, um, of those laying around. <laughs> Uh, or knows of a, a source for any of those. Um, and I, th I th we have, uh, Dave Herr has uh, agreed to let us use uh, two of his copper kettles so that we can make the product with. So uh, that's sort of where we're at. Uh, we need people to, I I if we want to do this, I'll say it that way, we need people to say, hey, I'll, I'll help peel apples. We have, I believe, at least two, maybe three Apple peelers, they're, they're pretty cool. You stick the apple on and you turn the crank and a blade comes around, peels the apple. Then uh, it goes off to someone else who just makes sure that the core is out and then the apples are quartered or cut up into snits or what have you. So uh, I'm rambling, but uh, <laughs> those, are, those are some of the things that we're uh, needing, some of the things that we have. And um, mostly it's, it's people who wanna, who wanna get involved and help. It is like when we start stirring on Friday night. It is an all-night uh, event. You have to keep the you have to keep the liquid moving in the kettle, so you have to stir all night. That's probably the least of my worries because the curiosity factor brings a lot of people out to to stir. It's the Thursday night snitzen party. Nobody wants to sit around in the picnic building down here, probably and peel apples. But uh, so that, <laughs> that's uh, that's the one that personally I'm concerned about. Um, so we're going to throw this out there and gauge what the reception is from all of you. And um, if we don't have a firm commitment, if we don't have some of the necessary items we have by uh, a drop dead date in June, and I forget what the date is, we're just gonna say, well, we can't do it and, uh, and, and forget about it for this year. But so that's, uh, that's the brunt of it. Uh, do you have that video apple butter? Just a little, 
uh, picture of years going by. Yes. Question. Do we have jars? Yeah, thank you. You'll see some strange looking people here. This is the snitzing party, cutting, cutting and peeling the apples. This was in the apartment over, uh, over yonder here that Reynolds used to own. That's the finished product. Well, the semi-finished product. Now, years ago, we used to make 13 kettles. We had about six probably underneath the pavilion, and uh, Weldon and a few of the men set up this big uh, awning out in the lot there, and we cooked six more. So when you start stirring, you got to keep on going. There's old Palmer Lutz stirring on that one kettle in his overalls. Now that's wh when it's done, dip it out and jar it. That's been a few years ago. That one was over at Reynolds' house. Mom way in the background there, Gertrude Huffman, I think, in the front. And there it is. Ray is guarding the gold. <laughs> so that's what's involved. <laughs> Keep that in mind. So uh, think about that and uh, pray about that. See if you uh, would be able to help at all. Thank you. As we begin our time of worship this morning, would you join me in our unison prayer? <clears throat> Ever-living God, your eternal Christ, once dwelt on earth, confined by time and space. Give us faith to discern in every time and place his presence among us, the presence of him who is the head of all things, fills up with the presence of Jesus Christ, our Son and Lord. Okay, I'm going to start out with a question for you. So, you know, where is Jesus now? Do, do you see him walking around on earth? No. Where is he? At the How do you know that? Because he got on the cross. And? He rose again. And? And? Okay. Yeah, he died on the cross. He rose again. And that wasn't quite the end. What happened after that? After he rose again for 40 days... He met and talked with a lot of his followers in many different times, many different places. And then what happened 40 days after he rose from the dead? What you said at first is really the answer. He's in heaven, yeah. You know, 40 days after Jesus rose from the dead, uh, he had called his disciples together. And he said, uh, I want you to wait here in Jerusalem for the gift that God's going to give you, the gift of the Holy Spirit. So they're waiting there, but then he led them out, and he ascended into heaven, back into heaven, and as uh, we're told, he sits at the right hand of God. The Apostles' Creed says you know, he's, he's there in heaven now, and one day he's coming back to judge everybody, those who are living, those who have died. So yes, Jesus is in heaven right now, but he gave us a gift of the Holy Spirit, which you'll probably be hearing about more in the next few weeks, which empowers us to do great things and to, to learn more about Jesus all the time. Now, I had a picture that I was going to bring, and I forgot it. Um, but when we were cleaning out my sister's house, she had this picture. I have no idea where it came from. But it's one of those pictures that you've probably seen some like it. If you look straight on at it, you see one thing, but you look 
at a, another angle, you see something totally different. Do you ever see a picture like that? Well, the, when you look straight on, you see Jesus on the cross with people around him looking up. You turn or you turn yourself a little bit, and you see Jesus ascending into heaven with everyone looking at him go. It's really kind of cool, but I forgot it. But anyway, <laughs> picture it. <laughs> um, so, you know, the Bible tells us that all this had happened, and Jesus told his followers before his death and resurrection that he was going to leave earth and go and prepare a place for them, that they would be where he would be also. Well, he did. He went back to heaven, prepared that place for all his followers to, to go. And when that happened, you know, in the book of Acts, it tells us that as they were watching Jesus ascend up to heaven, the uh, angel said, you're going to see him return in the same way. Well, that's what we're still waiting for. You know, that happened like over 2,000 years, but Jesus hasn't come back yet. Yep. Right, right, yes, when he was on the cross, there was three different people that were crucified, there's two of the people, three altogether, that were crucified at the same time, but Jesus didn't stay dead, right? Yeah, he rose, came back to life, and then the final thing was that he returned to heaven from where he came, but promises to come again, so that's what we're still waiting for, and uh, I, that's one of the key words today is wait. And how many of you like to wait? You like to wait? What do you like to wait for? For what? You wait for Jesus. All right, okay. I think I'll just leave. They got covered. <laughs> ah, good. Yeah. You know, in some ways, I don't think any of us like to wait, but... There's some things that are definitely worth waiting for, and waiting for Jesus to come back is one of them. So let's join the brethren in prayer. Lord, help us to continue to trust you even when things aren't going right, when it's hard to wait to see how you're going to work things out, when our prayers don't seem to get answered. Help us to wait and to learn in that waiting time. And we thank you that you fulfilled all the promises that you've given and we can trust you to fulfill the, the last, to come back and to make all creation new, and we can be with you forever. We thank you for all that you give to us and bless us with, Lord, and help us to continue to grow in your ways. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, thank you. As we prepare for our prayer time, uh, Ask her as they joys and concerns to share with one another and before the Lord. Uh, I'd like uh, if all of us would continue to keep uh, the confirmands retreat in our prayers this weekend. Uh, I talked to Kenny Barsinger and he was down last night. His daughter was baptized and uh, it seemed as though things were going well, except he said Bill looked pretty bad. And uh, for those of you who hadn't heard, he made a trip to the emergency room on Wednesday. Uh, was diagnosed with an infection and not sure exactly what it was, sent him home with an antibiotic, and he was really sick on Thursday, but got good enough that he could go in a retreat, which he worked so hard for. So we'll just pray for him and his healing, and, and that this retreat is really a, a special and meaningful time for not just the confirmants, but all that were there and their, their growth and their faith and trust in Christ. Let's join together in prayer. Lord, you've heard some of our joys and concerns, and you know, it's just a reflection of the life journey that we're on. Many challenges, many temptations, many blessings, many joys. We thank you for creating us for relationships, and with those relationships come all the above but it gives life a meaning for us. And you know, we do thank you for the adoptions that are final, for the graduations that uh, mark a, 
end of a journey and the beginning of new journeys. We thank you for the healings that take place, the body, soul, and mind, and we lift up to you those who are battling illnesses, whether something just temporary, whether chronic. Uh, through it all, we just ask for your healing of body, soul, mind. Ask that you bring strength and peace. We look at upcoming surgeries, we look at upcoming events, and we have much apprehension, Lord, but help us to know that, that you're with us and that you would continue to show us your ways, continue to guide us through the power of your Spirit, through the times of grief, the times of joy. Continue to just speak to our hearts and may we be open to listen to your leading. We thank you for the depth of your grace to us shown in sending Christ to be our Savior. And hear us, Lord, as together we pray the prayer he taught his followers. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it was in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. So let's sing together. <laughs> church. Our first scripture reading is going to be from the book of Psalm. We'll be reading the 37th one and it'll be verses 1 to 7. Do not fret because of evil men or be envious of those who do wrong. For like the grass they will soon wither. Like green plants they will soon die away. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him, and he will do this. He will make your righteousness shine like the dawn, the justice of your cause like the noonday sun. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret when men succeed in their ways, when they carry out their wicked schemes. 
And then we'll read from the book of Luke, um, chapter 24, verses 44 to 53. Jesus appears to the disciples in Jerusalem. He said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. When he had led them out to the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted up his hands and blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. Then they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and they stayed continually at the temple, praising God. This is the word of our Lord. Good morning. I know I don't look like Jan Seitz, but I am Jan Seitz this morning. <laughs> so... Um, I feel like it's the first time I've been up here. It's the first time in a long time that I've, I've been on this side of the microphone. Um, just a, a brief story. The, the title this morning of the message is Wait for the Promise. Well, there are so many promises in God's word for those who believe in Christ as their savior. So if you don't know him, whether you're watching at home this morning or sitting in the pews here this morning, Jesus loves you. God loves you. Jesus died for you. So listen to this story from the upper room that was so appropriate when I read it yesterday. The writer is from the Dominican Republic. The person said, I was driving alone on the highway, still two hours from my destination. I experienced an overwhelming sense of helplessness so powerful that I decided to pull over. I raised my hands and cried out to God. I wish I could say that crying out to him changed the helplessness I was experiencing, but that was not the case. However, something else happened that day. I got back on the road, and after driving a few miles, a glorious rainbow came into view. In that moment, my heart filled with hope. The rainbow reminded me of God's faithfulness and reassured me that God remains steadfast, celebrating our joys and embracing us in our struggles. Burdened with worries and doubts, we sometimes ignore or overlook what God has done and is doing in our lives. But that rainbow was a reminder to me that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. When we cry out to God, we know we can lean on God's promises of mercy and protection. His promise says, I'll be with you in troubling times. I'll show you my salvation. May we pray. Father God, thank you for the promises in the Bible. May we know and understand that they are for everyone who reads them, who accepts you as your Christ as the Savior, and that they are for us today, no matter where we are, who we are, um, whatever our situation is, whatever's going on in our lives. Thank you, Lord, for this church, for this, this church family in this building and those who are watching on Facebook or wherever they're seeing us this morning. We thank you for Pastor Larry, who has come to share the message with us. Be with him, Lord through the power of your Holy Spirit. May the message be loud and clear, and may it find a place to rest in our hearts and lives. In the name of Jesus, amen. Well, thank you, Deb. It's good to have you back in this side of the microphone. Wait. Isn't that a word you just love to hear? Well, of course not. <laughs> you know, in our technology advanced world, you know, we quite often expect and desire instant gratification. We don't want to wait. And for me, waiting in line drives me crazy. It seems like such a waste of time just standing there doing nothing but wait. 
But not all waiting is that way, though. As we go through life, we're able to wait for all kind of things and have to wait for them. We waited to learn how to ride a bike, to drive a car, to graduate from school, to get a steady job, to get married. We wait for the birth of a child. We wait for answered prayer. We wait for Jesus' return. And in all these types of situations, waiting time has value. During our wait, we gain more knowledge, we grow through experiences, and we prepare for what lies ahead. You know, many times in our times of waiting, our goals and our prayers are refined so that we're more in tune with what God's purposes are for us and for what he knows is best for us. We learn as we wait that we often don't get immediate answers to prayer, and we have to wait for God's promises to be realized. I've used this story before, but I think it makes a point. The late Ruth Graham said that as a young woman, she longed to be married and have a family. And she had a few serious boyfriends. And she prayed each time that that would be the one that that would be the one she'd marry, but God kept saying no. Well, she became very glad for those no's because later she met a guy called Billy Graham. And if she would have acted on her own, she would have missed a decades-long God-centered marriage as Mrs. Billy Graham. Well, the scriptures, as we read through them, continue to give us examples and challenges of the value of waiting. Wait for the fulfillment of God's promises and purposes in our lives. You know, think about Abraham and Sarah as they waited decades to have God's promised son. Or Joseph as he spent years as a slave and in prison before God exalted him as ruler, not over just his brothers and his family, but the nation of Egypt and beyond. The Israelites wandered for 40 years before claiming God's promised land. Jesus waited. He waited years as growing up as a young human man before he started his ministry. And many times during that ministry, Jesus told his followers that his time had not yet come. His time hadn't come yet to complete his earthly mission of becoming that perfect sacrifice for sins, then to be resurrected from death and ascend back to his heavenly home. Jesus had to wait. As we read earlier in Psalm 37, this psalm tells us to wait patiently for the Lord, to wait, to continue faithful to the Lord, trusting his ways, even when life's not going well. When we see evil people prosper and we fret and worry as we see them carry out their evil schemes against others. But the psalmist reminds us that these times are just temporary. And that the wicked, like all of us humans, will eventually just pass away. We're finite. But those who wait on the Lord, who put their trust and hope in God, will be victorious. They'll experience the desires of the heart. And those desires are that peace and joy that we yearn for in this life, and that we're assured of enjoying that glorious inheritance only possible with faith and trust in the Lord. On the church calendar, this Thursday is Ascension Day. Forty days after we celebrate Jesus' resurrection from the death, we remember his final chapter, the final chapter of his first coming to earth. It's the day he returned to heaven, just as he promised he would. Luke records Jesus' ascension at the end of his gospel, Luke, and then also in the first chapter of Acts, which he wrote. And we're told that for 40 days from the time of Jesus' resurrection until he ascended to heaven, Jesus appeared to his disciples, his followers, on many occasions. And Luke records one of those times, as was read in in chapter 24 this morning of his gospel account. And starting with verse 44, Jesus told them that when he was with them before, that's before his crucifixion and his resurrection, 
that he had told them everything about Moses, the prophets, and the psalmist, all those things that they wrote about Jesus. They wrote about his suffering, his death, and his resurrection. And Jesus said that it has also been written that the good news would be proclaimed to all nations. Then Jesus went on to tell his followers, in order for that proclamation to happen, he would send the Holy Spirit. Now, we know that that happened, but what did the disciples have to do? They had to wait. They had to wait. They had to stay into Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit would come and they receive that power from heaven. It did happen. Ten days. Ten days after Jesus' ascension on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit was poured out into believers gathered in Jerusalem. So listen to what Jesus had told his followers about his leaving, about his ascension, about his return to heaven, about the coming of the Holy Spirit. It wasn't only the Old Testament prophets and writers that foretold this, but this is what Jesus said would happen. He told his followers this before it all happened. He said this, in John 14, 12, he said, I tell you the truth, anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done and even greater works because I am going to the Father. Then in John 16, 7, and 8, Jesus said, It is best for you that I go away, because if I don't, the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, won't come. If I do go away, then I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world of its sin and of God's righteousness and of the coming judgment. And then John 16, 28, John, uh, Jesus simply says, Yes, I came from the Father into this world, and now I will leave the world and return to the Father. Jesus' fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies and the, and the prophecies that he made to his followers came true. He was put to death as that perfect sacrifice for our sins. He rose from death three days later, just as he said. And then in Luke 24, when Jesus was resurrected and talking to his followers, he tells them that they're to wait, to wait for the coming of the Holy Spirit. But Luke also writes then that Jesus' ascension, going back to heaven, had to happen first. So knowing that all this came true just as Jesus said, what about us? Do we trust his promises today? Do we trust them despite the confusion and wickedness we see all around us? Uh, the confusion and wickedness like the psalmist in Psalm 37 talked about and described. Now, we still live in that age of the Holy Spirit where, where Jesus' believers in all nations are empowered. And because of that, together, empowered by that Spirit, we can do much greater works for the Lord than Jesus was able to do when he was confined by time and space as a human living here on earth. But if, again, do we ask ourselves, do we trust the Holy Spirit's leading in our daily lives? Do we trust, as Jesus said in John 16, that the Spirit will guide you into all truth? The Spirit will not speak in his own, but will tell you what he has heard. He will tell you about the future. He will bring me glory by telling you whatever he receives from me. So are we listening? Are we listening to Jesus through the guidance of the Holy Spirit? And it talks about he'll tell you about the future. So what about the future? You know, there's that one final promise of Jesus that's yet to be fulfilled. That's his return to earth. This is a promise that wasn't fulfilled in 10 days, like his promise to wait for the Holy Spirit at the time of his ascension. No, the promised return of Jesus has not taken place yet. 2,000 plus years since Jesus ascended into heaven. 
Now, there have been and there may be many, many more of Jesus' followers over the years who have died. And their spirits have gone to be with Jesus in heaven, but they, like us, who are still alive in this earth, we wait. We await the day when Jesus returns to earth as a righteous judge. And one day, all people will be resurrected. There's new bodies. They'll be judged. And the body and the spirit of each will either be with Jesus in the new heaven and new earth, that restored creation where sin and evil and death and all those things are not even known of, or those who turn away from God and reject Jesus as Savior will be eternally separated from God in the torment of hell. So we wait. We wait for the end of our earthly lives through death or through Jesus' return. And if death comes first, Jesus told his followers, for everybody who trusts him as Savior, that he has gone from this earth to his Father's house in heaven to prepare a place for us. The words of Jesus in the scriptures and all but one or two of the New Testament writers tell about Jesus' final promise, about his return to earth, when he comes to righteously judge all people and usher in his followers to that restored creation of a new heaven and new earth. And when that final day comes, then our wait is over. It's over, for then we'll be part of God's glorious kingdom forever. So listen to the description of this final promise, the promise of the new heaven and new earth that Jesus gives us in Revelation 21. John writes these words. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. God living with us. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There'll be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. And then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty, I will give drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. And he who overcomes will inherit all this. I will be his God, and they all will be my children. But to inherit all this, guess what? We have to wait. We have to wait, and as we do, we endure many hardships along the way, as the scripture tells us. You know, two of those fruits of the Holy Spirit are patience and faithfulness. Those gifts are what the Spirit gives to us. And as we think about that, you know, let us continue to put our hope in the Lord, to seek his kingdom above all else. The benefits are truly outstanding. And God's inheritance is out of this world. It's well worth the wait. So now I want us to sing about our faith, about our trust, our hope in the Lord. For that scripture that talks about waiting patiently for the Lord, many translations say, you know, to put your hope in the Lord, that those who hope in the Lord will experience all these things, or those who wait patiently. So the hymn, Blessed Assurance, talks about that, and especially in verse 3, there's this line. It says, watching and waiting, looking above, that's looking to Jesus, filled with his goodness, lost in his love through the power of the Holy Spirit. So let's stand and sing together.
Praising our Savior all the day long, every day, is a full-time job. And it gets very difficult when we have difficulties in life, when we have to wait. <laughs> it becomes very difficult sometimes. But may we see the value in that and realize from past experience that waiting in the Lord has proved well for us. So may we continue to wait and see what the Lord has in store and look forward to the promises that he gives. So go name the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen.